Welcome to this episode of Process, the weekly program at The Print, where we discuss issues of national and regional significance. Uh, we are joined this week by Murtaza Solangi, eminent editor from Pakistan, and Dr. Aisha Siddiqa, columnist and commentator at The Print, who's joining us uh, from her home in London. We're discussing again what else Pakistan. And the reason we're discussing it again this week is quite extraordinary events continue to unfold in that country. A crisis within the judiciary, uh, a crisis just to top that off between the judiciary and the executive, escalating level of political struggle with Prime Minister Imran Khan, whom uh, some were predicting was a political history proving quite robust in fighting back. And of course, an economic crisis just to top everything else off, which is leaving some wondering whether there's any way out of this other than uh, early elections or even who knows military rule. Um, the latest step in this drama, just uh, ahead of making this program, is a litigation filed complaining about the legality of former Prime Minister Imran Khan's marriage, which seems to be the latest in a step of uh, cases intended to disqualify him from standing from election. Uh, Murtaza, perhaps I could begin with you and you could explain for our viewers just a little bit about what this case is and uh, what, its, what its wider political significance is. Well, it's an old case. Uh, it's about... Uh... Uh, the ceremony of uh, nikah, not once, but twice, when uh, Imran twice, Khan... Twice, just to clarify, with the same woman. With the same woman. Uh, the mufti who solemnized this uh, marriage is has been on record even before that... Uh, uh, he found out that the period of separation from your ex-husband that's supposed to be three months called Idat in Islamic Sharia uh, was uh, not complete. That's why he had to perform that ceremony twice. Um, and uh, Imran Khan and his current wife knowingly did that. Now, there are some legal uh, and uh, religious issues attached with this uh, two nikahs. And uh, there is a possibility that uh, it may serve a sentence, not only on Imran, but the lady herself. I'm not sure if that will take place. But at least it's one of the swords of Democles hanging over Imran Khan, besides other important cases like uh, Tosha Khana case, foreign funding case, and there's another important case of 190 million British pounds that were uh, supposed to be repatriated from UK to Pakistan's exchequer, but ended up in... Uh, going into the coffers of the business uh, tycoon who originally was punished for that uh, crime in UK. Um, and uh, uh, there is uh, an issue of kickbacks of around rupees uh, 50 uh, billion that uh, Imran Khan and his current wife uh, acquired from that business tycoon as a kickback by diverting that money uh, back to the tycoon. So there are multiple cases against uh, Mr. Khan. Uh, Dr. Aisha, I mean, it seems quite clear. I mean, as we as we know, the, the Pakistan Supreme Court has, in controversial circumstances, been asking for early elections in the province of Punjab and also potentially in Khyber Pakhtunpa. An order issued just today as we speak that uh, the State Bank of Pakistan should release uh, the money needed for this exercise. Uh, the political executive, on the other hand, virtually refusing to accept the Supreme Court orders, saying they're illegitimate, uh, all kinds of uh, squabbling and fighting among uh, various uh, judges of the Supreme Court. Uh, but doesn't the upshot seem to be that the effort to disqualify or discredit Imran 
um, it isn't really working out despite this mound of cases. Uh, the man still seems to be putting up a political fight. You know, let me get back to, uh, <clears throat> you know, the comments, which, you know, the explanation, which uh, um, with Murtaza Solangi, my friend, Murtaza Solangi gave. I mean, I was listening and I was like, how interesting. I mean, uh, it's the same game. It's, it's, it's all about politics, politics of, you know, pushing Imran Khan out. Uh, and, you know, the fact of the matter is Imran Khan is not proven to be an easy or a decent man. But, you know, we like him or we don't like him. It's a, the fact of the matter is all these cases is basically, again, politicization of religion, using religion to build cases so that he could, A, be discredited in front of the more conservative uh you know, uh, constituents, his constituents are also conservative, you know, uh, between centrist to, to right wing. So, you know, discredit him, build cases against him. Uh, you know, this this reference to the case of Iddat. Um, now, it's interesting that people could argue that, you know, there is a need to actually use this opportunity to kind of modify the rule itself. Now, Iddat, the whole process of Ida, the logic of Ida, you know, the waiting period of three months before a woman can marry a second time or marry another man is basically to ensure that she is not pregnant. Now, if I, I believe that now when if you can have and, 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 and uh, in the Muslim world, uh, especially in the Pak Indian subcontinent, this rule is being used in a very, uh, you know, uh, in in a strange way, I mean, you have seventy year old women uh, who cannot, who are not in a childbearing age, uh, made to kind of uh, you know uh, follow uh, this principle of not, which basically means three months you don't see any man, any na mehram, a, a man you uh, you know you know you you can marry or uh, so it's very funny and and and. You know, one could be more scientific about it. I mean, now with science, with the progress in science, you can find out. Uh, I mean, why make sure, a woman? Sure, work? sure. But in, right. in fairness, so, so, surely, if if I was a Nawaz Sharif uh, supporter, I would turn around and say, "Hold on, Idhat is only one of these cases, and it's only relevant because Imran himself made this big hoo-ha about how religious he is." And I would also say the rest of the cases are to do with corruption. Uh, he's the guy who said, I'm the honest guy, but here he is uh, allegedly on, on the take. How would you how would you respond to that? That this is Certainly, just No, no. There is there is that politics. And I'm sure and, and, and I'll tell you his three and a half to four years were not clean years. I mean, one living in Pakistan or watching Pakistan one would get very, very nervous about how he was, uh, you know, where he was taking the country. It was, he wasn't, his governance wasn't above board. Now, the problem which I'm trying to identify is that here is an effort to discredit him and to disqualify him. Uh, that's the purpose. The purpose is not to end corruption because, uh, you know, Malik Riaz, uh, that's the case that Murtaza is referring to, where 190, uh, uh, you know, million pounds were uh, were sent back to Pakistan. And out of that, uh, now Murtaza is saying there's a case that 50 billion rupees, Pakistan rupees were given uh, to Imran Khan and, and his wife. Now, the, the thing is that this is the same person, the same company, Behria, who also feeds the Pakistan People's Party and its leadership. So, here is the case of a very specific, you know, focusing, using corruption, using religion to kind of discredit and disqualify Imran Khan. And I'm saying that uh, politically, this may not, I mean, legally, things can work, but politically, this may not wash because people, general people are also watching it and they see the discrepancy. And this is precisely where Pakistan is divided. Within institutions, it's not just a judiciary. I mean, we see judiciary now divided in the middle between 
you know, there are four judges and and of of one kind who believe probably believe in Imran Khan, and there are others who think that no, he's not the right guy for Pakistan. You have military, which is also divided somewhere in the middle. Uh, we saw, in fact, r- recently we saw actually uh, two gatherings. One uh, where General Asim Munir was invited by uh, war veterans, retired military officers, and then there is another presentation by another bunch of uh, retired military officers saying that no, what whatever he is doing is not right. So. This is very political, and the the push here is to disqualify him because the ruling group at the moment does not want him there. So, Murtaza, the question I, I I had for you, listening to everything uh, Doctor Aisha has had to say, is okay. Um, Imran Khan is corrupt. Imran Khan is immoral. But in a democracy, you settle these questions by fighting an election. Um, one party defeats the other party, and the public decides that you know this guy is no good. Isn't the Pakistan uh, 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 Muslim League noon and the PPP aren't they just signaling weakness by trying to duck out of holding uh, an election and settling this in the democratic way? Uh, that might be true if you look at. Uh, uh, the situation from uh, the PTI's perspective. But here, uh, <clears throat> the stakes are high. Uh, Imran Khan uh, has tried to force um, many things. First, he tried to prevent the vote of no confidence from taking place. He failed in that. Then he tried to force uh, the military, uh, pressurize the military, uh, and create a situation where um, the current army chief would not be appointed. He failed in that. Then he used uh, the dissolution of Punjab and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa provincial assemblies to force early election. Um, And now, since he has dissolved successfully these assemblies, um, the current coalition partners feel that since 80% of the voters live in Punjab and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, so if you hold provincial elections there, uh, whoever wins and if PTI wins in both provinces, there will be no caretaker governments come National Assembly elections in October. And provincial governments have massive resources to rig elections. That's why in our constitution, the system of caretaker setup was introduced uh, uh, during 18th Amendment in uh, 2011. So there are serious uh, constitutional and political issues. So um, they they would have to go for elections in October, come what may, whoever wins, even if Imran Khan wins. But this will create a permanent um, distortion in our political system because after every five years, Punjab and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa would have to have provincial elections first and they would determine who rules Pakistan. So that's a big gamble. The stakes are high. That's why um, uh, they are resisting. The current establishment is also afraid and fearful of Imran's uh, early rise to power. And uh, they think that the adventurous man could make any dangerous adventure which could... Uh, destabilize the entire system. So that's why uh, they all are resisting. And now uh, part of the superior judiciary is acting as a sidekick of Imran Khan to create more judicial anarchy. So it's a complicated situation. You mentioned at one point very interestingly that the army internally is very, very divided uh, on, on where to take this. 
Uh, but the fact of the matter is that if this state of chaos persists for any length of time, a state of anarchy persists, where the executive is not willing to listen to the courts, where the court is divided, uh, ultimately the army has to play the final arbiter or the court of last resort. Do you see any possibility here that the military will, faced with chaos, find itself having to step in uh, to resolve this situation, which we know is something it's tried to avoid? They will act, they will find a way of intervention. I'm not sure if it would be a direct takeover of the country, given the financial situation, given the uh, importance uh, in terms of uh, strategic uh, uh, terms, uh, keeping the current uh, Cold War uh, into consideration. I'm Ishan. not sure. Uh, Dr. Aisha, do you, do, you, do you share that assessment that the army will try and resolve this problem, but maybe not directly through an intervention or could a situation arise where it has no choice? See, right now, I don't think that uh, the army wants to intervene uh, because there are other ways that uh, they could do things. I mean, right now, what's happening is they're trying to uh, use the judiciary. Uh, there is a fight within the judiciary. Um, and slowly and gradually, the army chief is strengthening his position. It's a matter of time. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, somebody could argue that, you know, Pakistan doesn't have money and this instability is going to cause um more a uh, greater financial crisis. Now, while this may be true, but the fact is that now they, the, the army chief also has a luxury to wait because even if Imran Khan comes back or even if uh, Shabash Sharif continues to rule, uh, the fact of the matter is money ain't coming in uh, very quickly. And so this instability, financial instability, is uh, the reality for the current time. All they need to do is kind of survive and strengthen his position, uh, you know, which could take, you know, uh, the next six months to a year. And, and that is what the battle is. I mean, try to find a way to keep this man out of the system, out of decision making. Uh, and remember one thing, I mean, let's not forget that in the past, historically in Pakistan, generals have come into power, uh, not because they thought, uh, yeah, the excuse was always that they want to protect the country, but it's always about them. You know, if, if they individually or as a group felt threatened, they came in. Now, right now, they feel that uh, there is a way to save the situation. Uh, I mean, it's an exhaustive battle. Every, you know, second day there is a new case against Imran Khan. And not that there isn't logic to those cases. But the reason these cases are being brought out is because, you know, you want to exhaust him, you want to tire him. It's a battle which is going on. Right. So I think there still remains room uh, which, which stops the military from actually coming in itself. Uh, a final, I'll give, I'll give the final question to you, uh, Murtaza, if I may, we're almost out of time. But uh, this IMF loan and financial aid that we've been hearing about dragging on and on and on, it always seems to be something that is going to happen next week. We've had program after program about it here. We've had you on some of those programs. Nothing seems to happen. In your view, is this delay and chaos going to work in the advantage to the advantage of the government? Or will Imran be able to capitalize on the deteriorating financial situation of ordinary Pakistanis uh, to say that, look, bring me back, I can save this country? Well, um, Imran Khan will uh, use all his tricks to destabilize the current political order and pressurize uh, the military, um, he will continue doing that. Uh, but you have to admit that uh, the current government has failed miserably uh, in stabilizing economy and uh, finalizing the deal with IMF. Uh, 
partly it has to uh, you have to blame the change of the driver on the financial ministry side uh, conflicting uh, uh, statements um, but it now looks like that the final one billion dollars they needed uh, a commitment from UAE have been committed so you might see a staff level agreement and eventually some you know resumption of the IMF program but the damage to Pakistani economy has been done yeah. so thank you so much for uh, to all of you I mean my takeaway from this is that uh, the Pakistan government is putting a noose around Imran Khan's neck uh, but uh, he's he's got a lot of grease around his neck and proving pretty adroit at slipping out of this noose every time it uh, tightens we'll have to wait and watch what finally happens but thank you very much for your time uh, Murtaza and thank you Aisha and we hope to have you back on the show very, very soon. Thank you all for watching Crosshairs again this weekend.